This week, in 2002, Philadelphia hosted the NBA All-Star Game at what is now the Wells Fargo Center. The 76ers sent two of their players, Allen Iverson and Dikembe Mutombo. Despite 25 minutes played from Allen Iverson, the Western Conference won the game by a score of 135 to 120. The MVP of that game, the late and great Kobe Bryant. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You'll never have me, Oh, this you crazy mother. Hello and welcome to another edition of Sports Talk Philadelphia here on LaSalle TV. I'm your host Josh Abrams. Today we're going to be talking some Flyers and then we're going to preview the Phillies as they look to start their upcoming season very soon. But first, to talk with Flyers with me today, we have Siobhan Nolan and Nick Kerr joining us. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. Let's get right into it. It's been a pretty good week since the last show we had. The Flyers are 2-1-0 and overall. And I think really the most encouraging thing, no matter what the record says, is that the teams that they're beating and the teams that they're really hanging in there against are going to be top contenders when it comes to the playoffs. And, and I'm not even looking at the Capitals just because of how good they are. We know how good the Capitals are, but the Islanders have our number this year. And I believe at this point in time now, we can't win the Islanders series because we've now lost two games to them. Yeah, I think the Islanders was always going to be a tough matchup, um, especially because a lot of their young players have been stepping up to the plate as well. But I think we had a really good comeback run going there for a little bit, which, you know, it was promising. It stinks that we did lose, but I think we fought till the end. And, it, you know, if nothing else, that was a really good takeaway from the game. Yeah, going off what uh, uh, Siobhan said, and if you look at the standings, both of those teams are always going, like, back and forth, and they're pretty much e e uh, evenly matched teams right in the middle of the division, so you know you always get a good game for your from the both of them. Yeah, and it's, it's, very, uh, it's very interesting because we know, I think a lot of people know how dominant, not just the Flyers, but even the Sixers are. The, well, the both teams that play at the Wells Fargo are, are splendid and spectacular, but the one blemish in all of that was last Thursday. Uh, I mean, I, I just very uncharacteristic loss to the Devils. Um, <laughs> but with that being said, these, these three guys have really stepped up. And uh, you really, when you look at it in order, um, it goes, you know, Couturier, uh, um, Lawton, and uh, Konechny. It's been Couturier recently, but in the beginning, at least since the All-Star break ended, or at least since, yeah, since we came back from it, uh, it was Couturier and Lawton for the longest time. And I think that's another good thing that we have. You know, we said it before, there are so many players that are so unexpected that are coming up. You know, Couturier, Hayes, Lawton, Farabee, you know, so many of them are just guys that you don't expect to be good and they show up when they need to show up. And I think that that's really promising even though they're not all young stars that we're gonna have around for a while, but I think having guys that just know what they need to do when they need to do it, that's a really strong aspect of the team. And I think that we're really lucky that we have so many guys that can step up when it's needed. When you have, the, when you have guys who step up like that, you know that, hey, they're trying to make a pretty good playoff run. And that's what they're trying. And if they keep doing what they're doing, with a few losses here and there, maybe they uh, will will get that uh, wild card spot. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up, Nick, because um, they, like generally, generally speaking, I think we feel good about the Flyers. And it's such a shame because you know, and we don't have the standings, the full NHL standings to provide for you. But if you look at them right now, I, I'm pretty sure the Flyers, along with like four or five other teams in the East that aren't leading their division, that aren't leading the, the Metro or Atlantic, they would be leading the West right now, oh, the Pacific. I mean, the, it, the discrepancy between the East and West is so apparent. And it it's is. just a shame that the Flyers have to play so well at such a, you know, at a pretty high level, mm -hmm. but they're still fighting for a playoff spot. Just what do you guys think about that, that just overwhelming difference between the conferences? It's such a competitive division that we're in, and I think that that's good in the sense that it brings out the fighting competitiveness in us. But then you have divisions like the West where 
I don't want to say it's easy because obviously it's professional hockey. It's not easy, but you know, you just you don't have to fight as hard and as tooth and nail as the Flyers have to do. And you think they're doing that every other day, week in and week out, you know, and on these road trips to the West where the Flyers have to travel 3,000, 4,000 miles with these teams that get ample rest and relaxation because they're not playing as hard. It is almost kind of an unfair matchup and there's not a lot we can do about it, but it's kind of like, you know, there are some factors working against us in that sense. And, and, and sometimes I think it's good that they play in, in the East, A, they don't have to travel as far and they play more games consistently back to back. They, they rarely go out to the West Coast, like they're flying down to Florida this weekend to play two games. That's not that far of a trip. Right. So th all of the teams that they're playing that are good are out here on the East Coast. So Yeah, and I mean, it's, I guess it's, there's, there's definitely pros and cons to it. Uh, it has its ups and downs. Um, but, you, you know, Siobhan is right in that it does build the strength of the team. Uh, it toughens them up for the playoffs. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll say it until the season ends or until the season's over. Like, I feel good if we at least sneak into the playoffs with, the, with, every, with all that being said. Um, and one of the reasons for that is mainly because of the, uh, the, mainly because of the goaltending play. We just got Carter Hart back yesterday. Um, and, you know, he, didn't, he actually didn't play last night in the, uh, in the Islanders game, which I was kind of surprised about, but then... I figured that since it was a back-to-back -back, that Elaine Vigneault wouldn't want to play him mm -hmm. on the back end of it. But, you know, between having Carter Hart and Brian Elliott, who we've talked about before on the show, is on the complete opposite end of the spectrum compared to Hart in terms of age, does, that, does having someone like Elliott, a good, competent backup goalie like Elliott, sure up at, uh, at least, or at least, like, solidify your confidence in the Flyers? I think it does because as much as I love Carter Hart and I think that he's a great goalie, he's still developing. It's his, it's his first full season. His away record isn't so great. Um, you know, he's still just coming into his own. And is Brian Elliott like a standout top goalie in the NHL? No. But he's good for us. He's good for Hart to learn from. He's been with us for so long and he's been in the league for so long that I think he's competent. He knows what he's doing. And at this point for a backup goalie you know, for to train someone like Hart, that's kind of all you can ask for. And I think that he does fulfill that duty pretty well. I think Elliot is a good mentor to Hart to show like all of the hard work that Elliot has put in for so many years. Hart can look up to without saying, hey, if I want to be in the league for this long, this is what I have to what do. But I think going forward, Hart is the right person for the uh, job for the rest of the season. Yeah, you're definitely right about that. It's, it's definitely nice to have someone like Elliot back, back up Hart, uh, really just give him confidence that, you know, hey, if I'm not going to be playing, at least I got, you know, I got an old guy behind me that can still, that's still a brick wall. That's, that's definitely cool. Uh, real quick before we go to commercial break, we have a, every game from here on out is going to be tough. That's just the way it is in hockey. Uh, but these next three games specifically are going to be very very difficult. One, because we're going on the road twice. And, yeah. you know, yeah. the, the road struggles aren't as apparent compared to the Sixers, but the Flyers obviously struggle on the road. Yeah. Um, with these next three games uh, in front of us, do we feel confident that we're going to at least finish with the, with the win or two? I'm feeling confident against the Florida teams especially. I think the Blue Jackets are where the worry really needs to be because – I think they're ahead of us currently in the wild card yeah, standings. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's just important that we really get the two wins against them. But I think they're all winnable games. And, you know, if we can, you know, beat the Capitals 7-2, to two, then um, Thanks for that shot. Any, anything's <laughs> possible. So I think they're winnable. I have a lot of confidence in them, so I'm, I'm going to put my faith in Nick, them. I'm looking at the Tampa Bay game, and I just can't see how we come away with a win in Tampa. What, what are your thoughts on that? See, Tampa is a hard arena to win at trust me i'm a caps fan we we the fact it took us seven games in there to yeah. win so they they were it's always electric there the crowd is always and and it plus you you have to fly yeah so you gotta, it's, gotta travel, it's right? gonna be a rocking place but it's gonna be hard yeah and i think just the fact that the matchup's late in the year um the, the flyers are built for this uh you have confidence that it's that they're going to get it done. Let's mm -hmm. let's see what happens though. 
Uh, but we're going to take a quick commercial break, but don't go anywhere because when we come back, we're going to talk some Phillies and review their offseason. So stay tuned. happy all day where they joke and they sing of the happiest things and everything's jolly and playful there's no one unhappy in happy there's laughter and smiles galore i've been to the land of happy what a bore what a bore what a bore Yo, bro, what's good? What's going on? How you feeling, man? I'm doing good. How you doing? When'd you start smoking? Smoking? It's a jewel, bro. It's a jewel? Yeah. Listen, you might as well be smoking cigarettes. When you start jeweling or vaping, you're four times more likely to start smoking cigarettes. Is that true? That's very true. <laughs> Give me the jewel. You don't need it. To learn more about e-cigarettes, go to thetruth.com. According to the Mayo Clinic, exercising has stress-busting benefits by bumping up your endorphins and improving your mood. Welcome back to Sports Talk Philly. Nick steps off, but he's replaced by another Nick. Please welcome Nick Lamergeezy. He is making his LaSalle TV debut. On with us to talk some Phillies offseason review. Uh, Siobhan, thank you for staying with us. Let's get right into it. Uh, I'd like to think that the outlook for the Phillies this season overall is a lot better, and I'm going to point right directly at the coaching. Mm -hmm. We got it. We get the new manager, Joe Girardi, and I think that really is going to be the key factor because we can make all the offseason moves we want we can uh, switch around the lineups and the rotations as often as we can possibly do it but if we need to have a competent guy on the in the dugout managing these people and we finally have that so I guess that's just my spiel in terms of talking about the offseason and what I like most about it there's a lot to look at within this offseason what appeals to you guys the most you know, I think you want to talk about competency and a guy that can get the job done. That's Joe Girardi. And I think especially compared to Gabe Kapler, who, you know, it, he was a new manager. It was his first time managing a professional team. He just, he didn't have the experience. And Joe Girardi, he's an old school guy. He's been through the game. He made some great signings in um, Gregorius and Zach Wheeler. So I think that he knows what he's doing. He has a good team to work with. So I think the coaching is the big thing, and it's going to make all the difference. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Uh, winning in baseball starts with veteran leadership, and, you know, Girardi's definitely a good guy to have in there. I mean, we all remember what happened in 2009, so hopefully he can repeat that with us, and I'm feeling excited about it. Yeah, and, uh, you know, among we can definitely go beyond the, uh, the managerial change there. Uh, I think really the two big signings that are going to headline the Phillies offseason is on both sides of the ball. We got Didi uh, Gregorius from the New York Yankees, and he spent the first five or six years of his career playing with Girardi, uh, has some playoff experience as a result. And then the other big signing that we had, and maybe not big necessarily, depends on what your definition is, but Zach Wheeler. Um, you, see the, you see the stat there, he's had a sub four ERA his entire career, but he hasn't really been a number one or number two guy. Uh, what do you guys think about the signings and really just talk about any of the any of the offseason moves in general? I mean, Zach Wheeler, we needed pitching. We can't just rely on Aaron Nola every fifth day to get it done. But I think Gregorius is a good 
um, position addition and, sh and shortstop because it'll be interesting to see that dynamic with Segura, where they're going to put him. I also think it's really important because that means that they're going to move Scott Kingery to third base. He might finally have a consistent position to play in, so that could bring out the best in him. So I think, yeah, they're not the biggest name signings, but it's what we needed. And I think that that's really going to help us, you know, bolster the both the mound and the infield. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, you know, these signings aren't uh, – Anthony Rendon or a guy like that, but you know we needed pitching. Uh, we needed a good left-handed guy, uh, so we filled that void with Wheeler. And the combination of Gregorius and Girardi, you know, they've done it before. They've they've been together, so I'm really excited about that. And I'm also excited about uh, Kingry moving into the infield. I didn't really like him that, that much in the outfield, just because McCutcheon was hurt, but. I'm excited right. to see him in the infield. Well, I'm glad you uh, I'm glad you segued into McCutcheon because that'll bring us to the opening day lineup, and I think that is really the most exciting thing about this. And I think that's what we were saying about the Phillies last year. Um, obviously, expectations were different, the manager was different, everything about the Phillies uh, the last couple of years was different. But with this lineup, again and again, going back to the whole point with Girardi, you got to have faith that this, uh, barring injuries, barring health, this this lineup is very impressive. And, uh, you know, I guess just talk about the lineup. What strengths do you see? Uh, any weaknesses you think could, could arise? Uh, so the floor is open to you guys for the lineups. I think Andrew McCutcheon back in the leadoff spot is so important because we had Kingery and Harper and Hoskins and Hazley, and it was just so many different people in the leadoff spot that weren't leadoff guys. I think McCutcheon is you our leadoff remember guy. When uh, Hoskins, they put, he put Hoskins as the leadoff. It just, we were just shopping around and just putting, you know, our hitters per se at leadoff and it just, it didn't work. And I appreciate Kapler for trying because we needed someone to fill that void. But McCutcheon is a good leadoff guy. And I think that hopefully our offense can improve this year. I think Kingery should be a little higher up in the lineup. I honestly think this is going to be his breakout year. That's just me. But um, I think for the most part, it's a good lineup, and I yeah. think that we can get a lot, of, a lot of hits and a lot of good hitting out of this lineup, hopefully if no one gets injured, but I think it'll be good. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I love McCutcheon in the one spot. You know, he's a great guy to start off the, the lineup. Um, I think the key for this lineup is definitely for them to stay on. You know, we had a lot of injuries last season, and that kind of, you know, brought us down a little bit. But, um, I'm excited to see Adam Hazley in the outfield, too, yeah. if we can keep him in that spot. I'm more of a Hazley guy over Roman Quinn, yeah. Uh, yeah. just because of analytics and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I'm feeling real optimistic about it. You know, I like looking at that lineup. I think we have a good chance. Yeah, it'll <laughs> certainly help with having Hazley starting in the major leagues compared to coming up a quarter of the way through the season. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another thing that we need to really discuss, and we've – Spent this, this time praising the lineup and the high hopes that we have for that. Um, but the pitching rotation and really the bullpen. Oh, my God. The bullpen is just not it, – it, they didn't really make any moves to improve it. And I know a, a big problem last year was that their bullpen was so injured that they just couldn't really find a consistent rotation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, how do you guys feel about the, the arms on the squad this year? Because – I don't think a lot of people feel good about it. No, I definitely don't. You know, it's it just it's really frustrating when our starters put together a good game only for them, only for the bullpen to blow it. Because obviously they're not Bradledge. They're not going to go the whole season without blowing a save. But I expect a lot more from them. Again, it's the major leagues. You're called up for a reason. You need to fill that promise and you need to fulfill that expectation and our bullpen just doesn't do that they're so inconsistent and you just never know what you're going to get with them and in the closing of a game when our hitting is still a little inconsistent too it's it's way too nervy so yeah yeah i agree i mean we're getting back hopefully a healthy adam morgan a uh, healthy tommy hunter mm -hmm. healthy sir anthony dominguez uh those are three solid guys i'd say um but I still think there's room for improvement. I mean, last year, like, the bullpen was pretty atrocious. Mm -hmm. You know, watching some of the games, it was like we were in the game and then well, six, and then we seven <laughs> a, big, a big reason for the atrocity from the bullpen was the atrocity that came from the first half of the, of the pitching scheme. I mean, there are starters 
we would hope and pray that Aaron Nola could somehow pitch every night <laughs> because he was the only, uh, only pitcher on our rotation capable of going beyond seven innings. Um, now, can Zach Wheeler go seven innings every game? I don't know. I, what do you guys think about the rotation this year? Ignore the bullpen for a second. Is the rotation going to be at least competent enough this year to give some rest or some, some closure for the bullpen? I mean, from the spring training videos that we've seen of them, they are looking good, obviously, it's spring training. But, you know, people need to understand, you know, that these aren't the days of Halliday and Cliff Lee and Roy Oswald. You know, it's not the big five anymore. But I think if we put our faith in them and we do believe in them and put some confidence behind them, I think that that could propel them to have more confidence in themselves and therefore pitch better, more consistent games. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it comes down to, you know, Zach Eflin and Jake Arrieta. If Jake Arrieta can, you know, get half of what he had in his Cy Young season, then I think that's, you know, a win for us. Yeah. But uh, if he keeps pitching the way he pitched the past couple of years, it's going to be tough seeing him on the mound. Sure. Now, looking at the rest of the, the, uh, the picture here, are there, any other pe are there any other people out there, any, ba any you know, position guys, pitchers, uh, bullpen, whatever the case may be, any – any names out there that you guys are looking for? Any more pieces they can add, you think? I've been hearing a lot of Chris Bryant talk, and we might have to <laughs> trade a lot of guys to get him. But, you know, on the off chance that we do, I think it could be a good addition. I'm not going to hold my breath. But, um, you know, I think right now we just kind of have to work with who we have because we have capable players. I think a lot of people are still kind of reminiscent for – the days of Howard and Utley and Rollins, and we're still kind of living in that nostalgia. So I think we put our full confidence behind the guys we have now, and we should see results. I really do believe that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if we could have anybody right now that's on the block, I would definitely say Chris Bryant, maybe even throw Schwarber in that trade. Yeah. Um, I'm also looking at Jock Peterson. You know, he, his deal just fell through with the Angels, so he might be a good guy. Uh, you know, split some time with Hazel in the outfield. You know, we can count on him for 25 home runs, 75 RBIs for sure. So I think that might be, you know, a good pickup for them. Let's All still right. try for Mike Trout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we'll ever, we'll ever get him. <clears throat> uh, but real quick before we move to our rants, um, how many wins do you guys see? I mean, I think a lot of us are expecting in the mid-80s, but I don't know if that's going to be enough for the, for the playoffs. I don't think it's going to be enough for the playoffs, but I think, you know, ceiling, talking about the highest, I think we could get up into the 90s. I think that's feasible. We just need to see how the team meshes together under Girardi. We need to see how they work with each other under this new system. But I think 80s, 90s, not totally unrealistic. I think it's doable. So I think we can expect something in that range. Yeah, I think 90 should be the goal for this mm -hmm. season. I mean, after going... 500 and two games under 500 the past two years. Um, anything over 500, you know, is obviously a step up, but I think their goal should be for 90 wins. Yeah. All right, well, uh, that, I think that's going to do it for, <clears throat> for Philly's talk. Uh, let's move on to rants. And um, my rant for, for uh, today's show is about Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons. This entire time during all of this, uh, the turmoil, the – you know, the poor play, the awful shooting. All I've heard, or maybe it's not all I've heard, because that's a little bit of an exaggeration. The most that I've heard out of the Philly media, on the radio, online, in the newspapers, whatever the case is, is that we need to pick and choose between either Ben Simmons or Joel Embiid. And it, I might sound like a hypocrite, because I have kind of hinted towards wanting to trade Joel Embiid. I've, I'll admit that now. But people need to realize that we cannot get rid of these two at least at the current moment. I, I, I know they have looked stagnant on the court together. I know it seems like one, one player limits the other. It, it doesn't matter. I think what everyone needs to understand and accept is that these two players are locked into the 76ers franchise for at least the next three years. We're not going to get rid of them. They're franchise players. Just be patient. It's going to work out. All right, Siobhan. You, are, you want to rant about the inconsistency of last year's Phillies. Yes. Um, the hitting was so inconsistent. I think especially Bryce Harper. 
this might be an unpopular opinion, but Bryce Harper did not live up to the expectations that people had for him. And I think it's especially disgraceful as Philly fans, we did not hold him accountable for that. And that's not acceptable. I think the players were really reluctant to take responsibility for how they played. Kapler was really reluctant to take responsibility for how he led the team. I think the way Kapler's talked about how you know the team and him didn't always agree. It, you know, it's not classy. It's not good. So hopefully Girardi can step in and do that, and he can fix that, and he can make sure that the players understand that there needs to be there needs to be more cohesion and there needs to be more responsibility. When you play badly, you have to accept that you have to go into practice the next day, and you need to just really take responsibility for that and do better. Before. Before we move on to Nick, I gotta ask: Do you think McCutcheon going down at the in the Padres series in the in May? Do you think that had that like kind of sparked everything, or how much do you think that had to do with it? I think that was the real turning point because without McCutcheon, we flailed and we just had no direction. We had no idea to, no idea where to go. You know, there was just a lot of moving around and trying people in different places and a lot of experimentation mm. and it didn't work out and I think a lot of people just no one wanted to say right. hey this was my idea and it just didn't work out. All right last but not least Nick you want to rant about the potential new playoff format I think you're in the majority here. Yeah I mean you know I get them trying to switch up the game for sure you know you're losing interest from younger fans um, that's definitely you know a thing but I don't think this is the way to do it. I mean, they talk about switching from 10 teams to 14 teams, having the two league uh, teams with the best record uh, have a bye, and then they get to pick their opponents through some reality show TV uh, format. That's what uh, Rob Manfred said. Right. Um, but I think, you know, I like how he's going about improving the game, but I just don't think this is the right way. You know, I think they should focus on more of the regular season and maybe even, you know, going to the game, taking some of the prices down. Like, you go to a Phillies game, you get a hot dog and a beer, and it's $17, $18. You know, that's probably part of the reason why people don't really want to come that much. Yeah, sure. All right, well, that's going to do it for this week's edition of Sports Talk Philly. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you catch us on social media. Follow us on Twitter at Sports Talk LTV. Check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash sports talk Philadelphia. And make sure you go on to LaSalle TV Philly on YouTube, where you can catch other sports talk episodes as well as the other TV shows there. We hope you enjoy your weekend, and we'll see you next week.